and I can't put into words how my desire for teaching keeps growing. And when the Institute has more personnel, you'll see how the academies will beautifully elevate the worship of the Blessed Sacrament, because it will be alternating both goals, bringing to the throne the exhaustion and the compassion we feel for our little angels, and later, bringing to our classes and the care we show to the girls all the blessings and lights received in the royal audience. When she was no longer the general of the Institute, and had retired to Valladolid as the grain that must die, she continued to dream of the good that education could bring about. Now that we have the terrain, we have to beg God to help us to construct a great building with all the necessary facilities, that he may receive great glory in our educating holy and useful women who will sanctify society. Mother Sacred Heart demonstrated a preference for the free schools, but did not exclude the academies from her care, because it is also the proper concern of our institute to promote the same good for girls from well-off families. We do not possess very many of her writings on education, but thanks to a letter from Mother Maria de los Santos Martes to Mother Pillar, we know something of Mother Sacred Heart's opinion about academies. Your letter gave me such consolation, and consoled Mother Sacred Heart as well, how much it speaks to me about the academies. I have read it to everyone so that they know what the first ones think, and how the ministry gives great glory to God. I will keep this letter as though it were a relic. Sister Mercedes Lezhano, who lived with Saint Raphaela for eight years, was one of the last handmaids who knew her personally. She wrote down some of the memories that she had of the saint with the desire of passing them on, since she considered it a great favor of God that she had been able to know her well. In November 1924, we opened the house of Siampino. Before going to our new assignments, we went to bid her farewell. She was at that point already quite ill, but when she saw a group of young handmaids gathered around her bed, she told us, you are going to open the first academy in Italy. Work with zeal and ardor to form the girls that the Lord entrusts to your care. It was the last time I saw her. Two months later, she went to heaven. These words, spoken in almost her last days, confirm once again her love for education. It was her role, for a long period, to have no involvement other than to consider the work carried out by other sisters to be her own. She felt that she ministered with them and among them and maintained the most careful and prudent interest in all the apostolic works that were coming into being. However, it was necessary to lay firm foundations, and both she and her sister allowed themselves to be tamped down in order to construct the solid new building. Chapter Roman II, Development of Our Educational Activity 1903-1932 1. Rapid Growth 1903-1932 Immediately, the grain of wheat began to bear fruit, to yield an abundant harvest, the building was being constructed quickly. God all faithful was accompanying the work that had been begun against all hope. God is much greater than his poor creatures. Mother Sacred Heart and Mother Pillar knew that now their role in the Institute was quite different. In the midst of heartache and suffering, they continued to trust blindly in that Father who had guided them with such love by pathways so different throughout the years. Now that their lives had converged, they had more clarity than ever about what God was asking of them. We must be the most generous, the most detached, and the first to cooperate in everything that will benefit the Institute, promoting its honor and consolidation in every way we can, and now with much more merit than before, because we do it stripped bare of any natural interest, but only for pure love of God. Let us become saints, and no one will do more for the Institute than we. Today, neither you nor I have an obligation to the congregation beyond praying for it and fulfilling well our constitutions and rules. God will demand of us a careful account of these duties, not of any other burdens and responsibilities that we might like to add on, but which are not our proper role now. The year after her resignation as general, Mother Pillar wrote the following during her spiritual exercises. I seem to have discovered with clarity that the grain must die in order to give the Institute much fruit. The two sisters were the solid foundations of the young congregation. From May 11, 1903, until March 7, 1933, Mother Purissima was the Superior General of the Institute. The congregation experienced much growth during those years. In 1927, as part of the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Institute, Pope Pius Roman XI received an audience including a large contingent of handmaids and laypeople from all over the world. He addressed them with these words. In view of a past so fruitful, a present so admirable, 
and a future so rich in hope, we offer a blessing to all the religious family of the handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, already sizable today and tomorrow sure to be even larger, and to all the houses of the Institute, beloved daughters, in which you deploy your zeal and exercise charity so fruitfully. When Mother Purissima took charge of the government of the congregation in May 1903, there were twelve houses, all of which save that of Rome, founded in 1890, were in Spain. 2. Extension throughout the world. Throughout these years, the handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, in answer to new challenges offered by church and society, responded according to the charism received by the foundresses. There was within the handmaids an ardent desire to announce the good news of Christ, so that all may know and love him. Of the thirty foundations undertaken in this time period, the apostolate of greatest breadth and importance is without a doubt that of education. The free schools had pride of place, just as the first constitutions indicated, but academies were not neglected. We cannot overlook at this point the Society of Jesus, which offered valuable help on many occasions. We even have the example of Fr. Osborne, S.J., who made his renunciation in favor of the Institute in order to make the foundation of Puerto de Santa Maria Cadiz possible. We are not talking about an academy, but rather a handmade community, his reverence says, an institute in which there is perpetual adoration and free schools, but this last without any obligation whatsoever, assuming that we want to establish them. The creation of works so numerous and varied demanded great dedication and sacrifice on the part of many sisters, as can be demonstrated throughout the writings that chronicle the different foundations. The universality so desired by Mother's Sacred Heart was now becoming reality. Despite grave international conflicts, the congregation grew to include England 1910, Argentina 1911, Cuba 1920, Peru 1921, Bolivia, Chile, and the United States 1926. Moreover, the number of houses in Italy and Spain grew. In order to consolidate the body of the Institute, a newsletter was deemed necessary the magazine Aura at Libra which went out to every corner of the Institute. The fact that our congregation has expanded to various parts of the world, thanks to the Lord's mercy, and the resulting increase in the number of houses and members, has given us the idea of writing this simple bulletin, in order to give our sisters news about the Institute, and its works and undertakings, especially for our spiritual good. The difficulties the sisters experienced in regard to means, communications, and languages did not deter them from their longing to make Jesus Christ present in the lives of all peoples, because all are children of the sacred heart of our good Jesus, and all have been gained at the cost of his blood, and any effort and sacrifice was worthwhile in the pursuit of such a great cause. In this respect, the foundation of the Academy of Kashabamba is very significant. It was undertaken at the behest of the bishop of the city in order to counteract the ideas promoted by a famous Protestant school. The sisters had to overcome considerable obstacles of every type, but God was waiting for them there, entrusting them with a new mission. Having prevailed over a thousand difficulties, we finally arrived, after a long journey, in the city of Kashabamba. The residents are affectionate, with generous hearts. This is where Jesus Christ wanted us. I will be favorable to you. Our arrival was an eventful, glorious day. The students were happy. The place is small considering their number, without any school furniture, and with many shortcomings. Yet not a single word of complaint was heard. Much the contrary, we are happy to have you. The sisters sent to Chile expressed themselves in similar words. They were received with gestures of deep respect to continue the work of the so-called English Preparatory Academy. The school had been founded in 1912 and run for many years by a profoundly Christian Englishwoman, Isabel Weber. When she was no longer able to oversee the school for health reasons, she wanted a religious congregation dedicated to Tichi to continue the work she had begun. The Lord, in His providence, wanted His handmaids to be that congregation. Upon examination, the growth of educational works during this time period demonstrates ever more clearly how deeply the desire for free schools had taken root in the Institute. We find one of the many proofs of this in the report of an education inspector in Sevilla. This past April 17th, the mothers of that house received an unannounced visit from the provincial inspector of public instruction, who wanted to examine the schools. She spoke with the mothers tasked with teaching. She asked about the schedule textbooks, curriculum, hours of class, the ages admitted, etc. She was greatly surprised when she found out that all of this was free, 
mentioning it several times, she was pleased in every way and remarked that she was going to send a glowing report, repeating over and over that she admired them for doing all of this for free and even more so when she found out that the girls who cannot afford them are given textbooks and notebooks at no cost. They never considered teaching a way to make a living. Their motivation was quite different as a document from that time attests. What enlivens our holy ambition is that richest of treasures that the divine blood alone has been sufficient to acquire, souls. In the poor schools, our way of thinking is more obvious. Since we never accept any compensation for our work, it is perfectly clear that we do not place any expectations of money or personal gain on our teaching. In the boarding schools, however, appearances could at times lead one to believe something different, and we have to be convinced that in no way is the mission of teaching a way to make a living for our institute, but is rather always and everywhere, despite any of the external trappings, a spiritual ministry, a work of zeal very fitting for the spirit of our holy constitutions. Therefore, just as our foundresses, especially Mother's Sacred Heart, had desired, the free schools were the most beloved work within our field of education. The data speaks for itself. At the end of 1932, there were 14 free schools with about 2,500 students. There were only nine academies with a student body of 1,250. Because they knew that it was God's work, the sisters placed their trust in Him. We don't know how long this will continue, because if it is not from God, it is not worth relying upon, since in this life nothing is stable. But this change motivates us to put our trust in the divine heart, master of all hearts, asking him to move them all, so that the hearts of the girls entrusted to us will be as much his as ours. And in the same way, since everything hinges on providence, everything being so new and so hidden, we rely on the prayers of our sisters, so that their desires contribute to the salvation of many souls. Nothing or no one could make them stop working and sacrificing, as if everything depended upon them. Although at times their situations were complicated, they sought, above all, to do good works, overcoming any obstacle in their assigned mission if there was the hope of doing good to others. 3. Quest for Excellence From July 1 to 8, 1926, the provincials, superiors, and school prefects met in Rome with Mother General. They felt the need to coordinate criteria for the essential elements of education so that our schools would be not only good, but excellent. If teaching was, according to the Constitutions of 1886, the first and most beloved of the Institute's apostolates, it was necessary to provide it with resources. Do we want this objective education, truly, cost what it may? Well, let us embrace the means to this end. Do we want to teach well? Then, let us form capable and complete faculties. Obstacles are vanquished, difficulties resolved, sacrifices accepted, setbacks endured. But after all of that, the students progress remarkably, and their families are joyful at having entrusted them to us, and the glory of God shines via a reflector as small as our least congregation of handmaids. For the governments of many countries, the question of degrees for women was not very important. Nevertheless, our sisters, attentive to the spirit, the calls of the church, and the new needs that were arising around this issue, were already giving concrete responses. Our institute, without entering into the question of feminism, accepts in its curriculum as obligatory for all its boarding students. In Spain, all of the studies of secondary education, including in some cases university-level classes, and in other countries, the education which would correspond to this. One of the best things which study can achieve is the awakening in young souls the love for truth, leveraging the innate curiosity of the intellect. It's not an easy thing to achieve, certainly, especially in these times in which superficiality and ease seem to be invading everything. The educational centers were, in general, highly valued during the years of Mother Purissima's government. They enjoyed the esteem of prelates, academic authorities, and society. Although school enrollment was not a topic that particularly worried the sisters, we do frequently find, especially among the prefects of the free schools, expressions of concern about not being able to admit all the students who would like to attend. In this sense, the case of the Academy of Buenos Aires is interesting. It began to function in March of 1914 with four students, and two years later, the sisters found themselves looking for another building, because there was not enough room for all the students. Since enrollment was increasing day by day, and due to space limitations, they could not admit all the girls, 
as they would wish to do. Following the counsel of the Fathers of the Society of Jesus, they proposed to Mother General Reverend Mother Maria de la Purissima the acquisition of another house, making one a boarding school and the other a day school. Mother General approved the idea, and on the 8th of March, the Academy of Belgrano was opened. They also made great efforts to improve the quality and organization of the educational centers. The brochures that were given to families, explaining how the school they had chosen to educate their daughters functioned, give eloquent testimony to the attention to detail, objectives, pedagogical methods, subjects that should be studied, the system of organization. We can admire how nothing was left to chance. Even very concrete details were included. Although every effort will be made to ensure that the students speak French and English, instruction will not be limited to this skill only, but will also include having students study the great authors so that they may master said languages perfectly. The curriculum of the free schools was also very carefully considered so that they would have plans of study that supported their objectives. Since the first class is French, they arrive very punctually. With the new curriculum, they are very eager and you can tell they are anxious to learn. Typing and bookkeeping are the subjects that are the greatest novelty for them, and they are taking great advantage of these courses, to such an extent that we have already been able to place some of them in good businesses in Gandia, and in one of them, they are waiting for the girls to complete their training in order to hire them, saying that they prefer our students because they are entirely trustworthy. We cannot but be amazed that our sisters, in that time period, had such a clear conviction of the importance and significance of the education of women. 4. Well-trained sisters. We have already seen in the last chapter that, as our educational works expanded, the foundress's constant preoccupation was proper formation for this delicate mission. In the first constitutions, it was already legislated that the members of the congregation should have aptitude and receive preparation for teaching. As a fundamental element from the beginning of the institute, this soon becomes the object of regulation. Mother Purissima and her assistants made the decision in 1915 to not admit any choir sister who lacked a certain level of education, according to the constitutions, without defining what this necessary level would be. A year later, in a circular letter addressed to the provincial superiors that touch upon many topics, in the section that dealt with formation, the level of education required of applicants to the institute was specified. The minimum or ordinary level of instruction for us will be approximately that which includes the curriculum of our academies, up to the third year, inclusive, plus what is termed special, which encompasses the most essential knowledge. In countries outside Spain, obviously the equivalent level would apply. Moreover, everyone must learn a foreign language, which will normally be French, or whatever the superior assigns each one. In the same letter, it also states that novices, in their second year of novitiate, should continue these studies to completion, after which they should make vase. During the first year, they will have classes only in arithmetic and penmanship. The last paragraph of this letter is of major importance, because in an explicit way it establishes the juniorates. Once the novitiate is completed, our sisters may not be missioned indiscriminately to any house, but only to those designated for them to continue their studies and formation. The normal time for finishing studies and other tasks to which it is desirable to assign them will be at least two additional years. During this time, and generally until they make their final vase, our sisters of first vase will be separated from the professed sisters. From the time the juniorates were established, ever greater care was directed toward their organization, always with the desire that our young sisters be well prepared with one single objective in mind to carry out their mission-oriented work as well as possible. We have, undated and unsigned, a set of norms composed with the title, Principles Established by our Ara Mother General for the Organization of Our Studies. 1. Juniorate studies will be correlated to the established standards for academy study with the expansion necessary so that the mothers can be academy teachers. 2. In regard to the form of studies, it must be eminently practical and always oriented toward training hours with teaching aptitude so that even rudimentary concepts, for example addition, multiplication, the definition of a verb, etc., will be covered yet again with the hope that what they have already learned they will now know how to teach. 3. In addition to this general orientation, those who will be teachers should acquire the general fundamentals of pedagogy and the methodology appropriate for each subject 
they should also experience teaching practicum. They spared no effort in the area of training. The Institute was a pioneer among religious congregations in its creation of the junior rates. Great care was invested to ensure that the intellectual formation would be the most comprehensive possible for that time. Academic degrees were becoming indispensable according to the demands, some more reasonable than others of the governments of various countries. There was also utmost interest in caring for the juniors' spiritual formation. Mother Purisima wanted the juniors to be excellent students, but, before all else, excellent handmaids. In regard to the junior rates, it is necessary to ensure that the mothers who are being prepared within them for the apostolate of teaching be above all excellent religious, by whose conduct, word, and example our students take in a true and transcendent Christian attitude toward life, even without their realizing it. In the minutes of a consultation by Mother General with her assistants, we find the following. The topic of the studies of ours was again the subject of deliberation, with Mother asking the assistants to study the point anew before deciding if what we have felt up to this point is indeed advisable, that we establish that the majority of ours be educated to the level which we call here in Spain Master Teacher, or its equivalent in each nation, and that those for whom it is advisable to go further, to the level of an education degree or professor of normal schools, without restricting the possibility of adding or removing courses, as seems appropriate for eat. On May 24, 1925, in a private audience which Pope Pius Roman XI granted to Mother Purissima, after asking her about the foundation of Siampino where, alongside the school and academy, the Italian Juniorate would be established, the Pope commented, that will be a beautiful work when it is finished, because these days education is the undertaking of greatest importance, and even more so to educate the educators. Do not spare expense, sacrifices, personnel, or the means necessary to arrive at the most complete training. May nothing, however small, be omitted. It would be better to go above and beyond just the necessary. Do not omit anything, because if something is missed, it will be missing forever and that religious whose training is thus left incomplete will not be able to do the good that is necessary for the Holy Church. The proof of the importance that was given to this stage of our sister's formation is demonstrated in the fact that juniorates were already being erected in Spain, Italy, and England. Mother Purissima often recommended that superiors be careful to train teachers well. In this work of the academies, the glory of the most sacred heart of Jesus is very involved, because when we educate girls, we educate the future families, which tomorrow will shape society with greater or less religious spirit. According to how the women are therefore, be very attentive to the academy, encourage the mothers who are dedicated to it to labor enthusiastically in this great work, and help them with anything that they need to fulfill their obligations well. It was important to her that the handmaids become apt instruments for the glory of God the more apt, the better. 5. Responses to New Needs during the government of our mother foundresses, we have seen that alongside the free schools and the academies, other apostolic activities related to the world of education were created and supported, and that they experienced dramatic growth in this period. Because of the rapid international growth of the Institute, it was not always easy to open a school or academy, for many obvious reasons. Our sisters, however, because of their apostolic thrust and fidelity to their charism, were constantly responding to other educational needs that were emerging in those moments. When the first foundation was made in England in 1914, they began an outreach similar to that of the night schools operating in Spain, the associations and the clubs of Our Lady of Nazareth, St. Zita, and St. George, where sisters taught religion, accounting, sewing, and languages. The majority of the young women who attended these clubs belonged to an underprivileged social class. In 1918, the foundation in Havana, Cuba, was considered. The bishop did not grant the permission to establish the congregation there for the reason that there were already other teaching sisters in that city, but mainly because the he did not have a clear concept of the institute. Two years later, the foundation was begun, with our congregation taking charge of one of the workshops, which the Apostleship of Prayer was constructing for 178 working women in Liano, a poor neighborhood of Havana, where the total lack of churches and clergy meant that moral poverty surpassed material poverty. I beg your reverence to explain to me, with total simplicity, clarity, and freedom, 
the form and conditions in which we would be able to establish these workshops, so that I, with all the information at hand, may be able to write to tell your reverence what we would be able to do, since I always desire whatever is most apt to give glory to God. In very little time, the bishop, ever more pleased at having the handmaids in his city, gave the authorization necessary to found another house dedicated to education. In Palermo, Italy, some laboratories were opened in 1920, with 26 young women enrolled, it being impossible to admit more due to a lack of space. The University Apostolate was the object of special attention in Philadelphia. On the occasion of the Holy Year of 1925, the Cardinal Archbishop of this city, Dennis Doherty, went to Rome. He wanted the handmaids to go to the United States. For the time being, it was impossible, for reasons of ignorance of the language and customs of the country, to open an educational center. The Cardinal offered Mother General, therefore, the free use of four and joined row houses he had near the University of Pennsylvania. He wanted the sisters to attract women university students and look out for their spiritual welfare. We also offered free classes. About 500 women students were enrolled, among them many Protestants and a few Jews. The sisters conducted classes in religion, painting, drawing, music, needlework, French, Spanish, and Italian. We understand how well this effort functioned when we read this account. The classes are like those of the study room at Kingswood. Each student has her own desk. The Burlitz method is displayed on posters around the room, and there is a blackboard, quite large and made of real slate. Everything is very well arranged. There are three classes, French, Italian, and Spanish. Each language has its own classroom, and there is also a lovely studio for painting and drawing, and one for needlecraft, with a very large table that has everything necessary. Nothing is lacking, everything has been well planned. The music room, magnificent, with a grand piano made of mahogany. I hope that this house will give much glory to the Divine Master and will be for him a reparation that consoles his Divine Heart. Everything seems to suggest that it will, because the beginnings are marvelous. Although the schools and academies produced many and generous vocations, the harvest was very abundant, and those sisters felt deep within themselves the urgent concern that the Institute grow in order to help with all the needs that they were discovering. May all their desires to contribute to the salvation of souls be fulfilled, and may there be many girls who, not contenting themselves with an ordinary life, give themselves to the Lord in religious life and come to increase the number and joy of the handmaids. In 1917, a first academy for aspirants was created in Salamanca. Two years later, it was moved to Palencia. It managed to enroll 30 aspirants to religious life. Another was opened in Burgos in 1927, but having very few students, it had to close three years later. There is preserved a very simple set of regulations, consisting of four pages typed on both sides, where the objective of this kind of work is specified. In order to promote religious vocations and educate the girls in a true and solid piety, giving them as well a thorough education appropriate to this objective and also instructing them solidly in the subjects indicated in the plan of studies. The sisters had clear goals for this new apostolate, and for this reason, upon seeing that it did not achieve the objectives they had planned, not doing all the good that could be done, it was suppressed in 1923. 6. The Church's Interest in Education the Church in this period considered educational apostolic works to be of the utmost importance because of the influence that they could have on society. On the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the definitive approval of the Constitutions, Pope Benedict Roman XV wrote to Mother General, On my part, I give thanks to God for allowing me to have been a witness to the growth experienced by the Congregation of Handmaids. Now I understand that here in Rome, just as in any place they are found, the Congregation of Handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus does not falter in carrying out the principal goals of the Institute. The special worship of reparation offered in handmade churches to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, particularly in the Most Blessed Sacrament, is worthy of commendation. No less praiseworthy is the education and teaching which are offered to all classes of society, always with preference for the poor through free schools or, at least, some sort of education in every house. On December 31, 1930, Pope Pius Roman XI promulgated the encyclical Divini Ilius Magistri, which had great impact in those times about the Christian education of youth. In it, the Pope emphasizes and praises the work of Catholic education. He remarks, 
Perfect schools are the result not so much of good methods as of good teachers, teachers who are thoroughly prepared and well-grounded in the matter they have to teach, who possess the intellectual and moral qualifications required by their important office, who cherish a pure and holy love for the youths confided to them, because they love Jesus Christ and his church, of which these are the children of predilection. Let us then pray the Lord of the harvest to send more such workers into the field of Christian education, and let their formation be one of the principal concerns of the pastors of souls and of the superiors of religious orders. Without a doubt, those handmaids of the sacred heart of Jesus had to feel very confirmed in the apostolate of teaching. From that first classroom opened in Madrid in 1878, the journey had been long and difficult, filled with lights and shadows, but had been worth the effort. The educational life of the Institute was growing and blooming, becoming light. Between 1903 and 1927, the number of former students who had entered the congregation was 232. There was no doubt that the Institute had been born of God's will. Chapter Roman 3 The Importance of Education Grows Ever Clearer 1932 to 1965 1. The Leadership of M. Christina From March of 1932, until January of 1965, Mother Cristina Estrada held the office of Superior General. A woman of intelligence and great vision for the future, she directed the Institute with a firm and secure hand throughout those years. If our mother foundresses had been the foundations of the Institute, she was the pillar that sustained it. Throughout these decades, many significant events took place in the religious sector, in the political world, and on the social stage, the Institute, too, underwent substantial change. The desire for universality, which flowed through the veins of the congregation from its beginnings, was growing ever stronger. The Institute grew from country to country very rapidly. France 1931, Colombia and Portugal 1933, Japan 1934, Belgium 1936, Uruguay 1939, Panama 1947 and Ireland 1957. Vocations soon began to emerge. This was of the utmost importance, as was the need for a progressive enculturation in order to attract souls and draw them closer to God. Not only become accustomed to the habits and customs of every place, which is a requirement that life itself imposes, but enter into them, taking on the way of life of the various countries, studying their character, their tendencies, their mentality, adopting them, so that within them, and in concordance with them, we can sow and cultivate the divine seed in the way most appropriate. May we not limit ourselves to our own way of being, but rather realize the beautiful and Catholic program of St. Paul. Make ourselves all things to all people in order to gain all. By the end of 1965, the Institute was already established in 15 countries, not counting the foundations of France and Belgium, since these were created in order to respond to the grave situation of religious persecution that Spain was undergoing during part of this time period. 2. Modernization and Collaboration Education, basically as applied to schools and academies, now acquires in every respect a level of development previously unseen. We must recognize, in our fidelity to the historical evolution of the Institute, that there is a before and after. The before, except for the case of the mission of Japan, would be configured, as far as the structure of the works, in a line of continuity with the final years of the previous epoch. The after has a starting point that is quite important, the applications of the decrees of General Congregation Roman VIII. The life of the congregation, ever more thriving, had made this convocation necessary. It will be this general congregation, which dedicates chapters Roman VII and Roman VIII to schools and academies, that will inspire the actions of the coming years in the educational arena. Among the decrees that present some immediate difficulty are those which refer to teaching, the good will of everyone, and their great love for the Institute, along with the conviction that we are moving towards an obvious progress in our school activity, will be enough to make us do everything necessary in order to arrive, as soon as possible, at the definitive establishment of the new structure. The work of the schools and academies, despite the great changes they were gradually undergoing, was carried out in the Institute, just as in previous times, in an attitude of fidelity to what the Church needed at that moment, always from the perspective of our reparative charism, and with the goal of finding the best responses to what the society of the time needed from religious life and specifically from our congregation. 
the conviction that the Lord enables our work when we do our part was a key concept. The mission with which he entrusts us is an important one. We are called to win these innocent souls from their first steps in life. It is not, therefore, my intention, as you know, and have heard me say other times to multiply activities in the eagerness to take on more and more, but rather that you strengthen the resources and acquire a better preparation, first of all spiritually, which will give success to our efforts, and also in everything that the work of each one requires, never forgetting that when the instrument is more apt, its objective is better fulfilled. Thus united in one single love, love for that heart which so loves us, our works will be truly fruitful. It was clear that the great number of schools and academies that the Institute had in so many places required good organization in every aspect. In 1946, the position of Provincial Inspector of Studies was created in order to help provincial superiors with novitiate and generate studies. Two years later, the studies that took place in schools and academies would also be assigned to her. Three years later, the General Secretariat of Studies was already operative. Its headquarters were in the General Curia, in Rome, and at its helm, up to and including the year 1968, was Mother Margarita Agorazabala. Its mission was to direct, focus and unify the teaching taking place in our educational works, and also orient, stimulate, and assist the sisters assigned to studies, maintain the cultural and academic level which religious educational works should have which is of no little concern to the church and to the congregation. In the archives of this general secretariat there is abundant documentation which demonstrates the volume of work and the enormous effort expended by those who directed and closely collaborated in this activity. Thanks to these sisters, our schools and academies were able to excel, both in academic aspects and in the more specific efforts of human formation, and to be better tools for evangelization. The free schools continued to be an object of preferential attention in those years, just as they had been for the foundresses, and for that reason, where pressing needs were apparent, new centers were opened. Always and everywhere, one of the works to which we must be dedicated with greater interest is that of the schools. Carrying out so many projects almost simultaneously necessitated a major effort, including in the economic sphere. From the 1940s onward, in Spain and in some Latin American countries, Subsidies provided by the state helped us to improve our schools. It was proposed that for those centers which could not afford to be updated, other funding sources be considered. The times had changed, but the spirit of the Institute continued to be open, with a forward-looking vision in terms of the education of women, their place in society, and the need to overcome social barriers. We know that actual customs are very different from those that existed in Spain when our Institute was founded. This makes us see that, following the norm given us in our constitutions, the instruction we must give in our schools has to be better than what we have provided up to this point. However, not only for this reason, there are two more factors that should motivate us to strive to provide our students with a relatively elevated cultural formation. In order to remain virtuous, our current students must have firm principles and very clearly defined personalities. The other reason to foster culture among our students is the following. We do not educate these girls for today's world. We educate them so that they may act freely in 10, 20, 50 years. Modern day society is changing in the sense of giving equal rights to women and men, to children of humble families, and to those of the well-off. Because of this, many leaders already come from the working class. Our concern, then, is that if the working class will produce many leaders, that they be those who, because of being educated by religious, have a deeper and more educated faith. This strong concern inspired the Institute to offer a broad selection of better possibilities, whether in studies, which were becoming specialized in a more markedly professional vein, or in human formation, lengthening the time our students attended the schools. There were already governments requiring this latter change. Continuing in this same vein, in some schools, the so-called differential education was included with success in order to help the students who were behind in their learning or who had less intellectual capability. The sisters were also urged to sacrifice part of their vacation time in order to assist those students who needed extra help. The Lord, being who He is, will repay you for your efforts and bless your work. Nothing you do for these souls, His favored ones, will be left without recompense. So that cultural formation 
could be provided to the most underprivileged sectors of society. The gratuitous nature of our teaching, something the Constitution set forth, was emphasized time and time again. Our constitutions stipulate that the teaching in schools be free of charge. What is more, those of us who live here in Rome, in the very center of the church and close to the Vicar of Jesus Christ, know how much the church desires that teaching and apostolic works be gratuitous, and how pleased she is when this takes place. In addition to these, we can add yet another reason for maintaining the free education that the constitutions prescribe, now that governments understand that education ought to be the patrimony of everyone, not the private domain of a privileged class, they are now offering more years of free education, making it obligatory and therefore free of charge. When she addresses the matter of admissions, Mother Christina also reminds school parents about our spirit. In accordance with the letter and spirit of the rules by which our congregation conducts itself, we must give preference to the education and instruction of girls who are truly poor. The reason for this is that these girls often have great difficulty finding centers which will provide them, even in the area of morality and religion, with the instruction and education that would be good for them. The parents' associations of our schools were very well organized and offered valuable collaboration. They would go on to have a common set of statutes for all countries. It has been a great comfort these past few years to see the resurgence of these thriving, enthusiastic associations, and to receive news of the spirit with which they collaborate with the mothers. The abundance of praise that these centers received, especially after the creation of the General Secretariat of Studies, should not surprise us. One interesting fact is that in a few cases, families did not mind the child repeating a school year, even if the grade had been passed, simply in order to be assured of a place in our school. The facts speak for themselves. At the end of 1949, the 27 schools of the Institute had educated 3,660 students. In 1964, the number of centers of this type reached 35 and educated 8,678 girls. The applications were so numerous that many of the schools underwent urgent expansion. The academies were also the object of ample attention during these years. Every day one feels more clearly the importance of the work of education. I would like ours to regard it with true predilection. May they not spare any sacrifice in order to prepare themselves for this mission, making themselves capable in every sense of the word, not only in regard to instruction, but also in being able to educate the hearts and wills of the girls within the context of a perfect living of Christianity. Just as in the free schools, the growth of the number of students and the rigor of new curricula required expansion and improvement of academy facilities as well, it is important to keep in mind two facts. The first was government's recognition, at different levels, of the need to have independent educational centers. This gave the congregation greater freedom, and also fostered a better level of formation for our students. However, it also meant a greater responsibility for the Institute, since it was now necessary to have a numerous and well-qualified faculty, which we did not yet have. The second fact was the ever-increasing access to employment being granted to women, which awoke in families a great interest in the comprehensive formation of their daughters. Practically all of the students of our academies followed a plan of studies which allowed them to go directly to higher education. Therefore, it is necessary to reflect upon the resources and methods we use, in order to reaffirm ourselves in the many good things that we have thanks to the Lord, to detach ourselves from anything that is useless or harmful, and to adopt whatever of the new that will be helpful and useful for what we are trying to accomplish. It is important to note that in the academies, before the year 1950, there were already lay people involved, especially in the secondary levels of teaching. In the beginning this measure was accepted as a temporary measure, while the youngest handmaids were preparing to obtain the needed certifications. This lay participation was necessary in order to avoid closings that would counteract our collaboration in the church's work. Soon, the positive aspects of this measure were seen, as well as the need to effectively form and integrate lay teachers into the educational task, alongside and with the religious. Can we not manage to offer greater involvement in all things educational to our lay teachers and staff, in the simplicity with which you go to them for help, and in the caring role which you entrust to them, you demonstrate that they participate in fact in the mission of education. 
I believe that it is most important that we show interest in them, and that we help them take on part of the educational work of the Academy, striving to instill in them the apostolic spirit. We also have to help them in any way we can to bring their formation to perfection. In 1960, Mother General published Academy Organization, which was a compendium of norms and principles which would, in the years to come, regulate all the aspects of the life of the Academies. This organization would give a unique and almost universal style to our academies. The academic level rose notably. Every effort was made to gain from government entities the recognition necessary for us to give an official education. In some of the academies in Spain, an educational track was offered simultaneous with other studies in Magisterium of the Church, a certification which would qualify students to teach at the levels corresponding to preschool and primary school. The formation of teachers with firm human and Christian principles was also one of the great concerns of the Church, and thus for the Institute as well. The objective of the School of Magisterium of the Church is completely apostolic, to contribute to the re-Christianization of society by means of the formation of solidly Christian teachers, given this objective, it would be preferable to have as students precisely those young women who seem likely to be teachers in the future. Almost all our academies were very highly valued, not only for the quality of their teaching, but also for their good religious and moral formation. The statistical data about the student bodies is even more surprising than the information about our students in the free schools. In 1949, there were 25 academies in the institute in whose classrooms 6,641 girls and young women were educated. In 1964, there were already 34 centers with 12,826 students. Nevertheless, we must read these numbers from a concrete historical moment, one in which the Institute desires, once again, to respond faithfully to its origins. Culture is now becoming ever more important in society. Differences between social classes are being reduced. It would be, therefore, ridiculous, not to mention less Christian, if we sisters work to maintain this distance. Steadily we move towards the fusion of our poor schools and our academies. In some countries in Latin America, this had already taken place, thanks to the assistance given by governments to some private Catholic schools that imparted secondary education.